Liz Logan, and this is the fate of weight, semi-brittle ice, and potential calving rates, or what do we do about calving? And I've highlighted the semi-brittle part here, because that's what the next 300 seconds or so is about. Uh, but first, I feel like we need to acknowledge the question, do we even care about calving? Right now, calving and melting roughly split the global budget, but what are we to do in the face of something like nine meters per day of submarine melting? And when I start to get really down thinking that I'm studying something obsolete, I just try and remember the Larson B ice shell, in which we had the dastardly combination of melting and pre-existing cracking come together to disintegrate the shell. The glaciers there are still pouring into the ocean. And I think even though this is a, a bookend member of calving, right, it's really atypical, um, it still serves to illustrate that melting and calving are not necessarily competing in independent processes, but rather work in tandem and interact. And so many smarter people than myself have approached the cabin problem using an array of techniques, and this is an enormous slide that I won't unpack for you, but it just really serves to illustrate that uh, cabin is complicated, and if this picture is complicated, it's because there have been many approaches to study this complicated problem. And so why complicate the picture any further? And this is only to say, really, that um, we might be better served or might approach the problem of the universal calving law by shifting the focus from universal calving law to perhaps a universal calving material. So what might one such calving material be? We all know that if you pull really hard, fast on ice, it ruptures in a brittle way. And if you pull on it slowly, it flows in a ductile way. So if you ascribe to those two brittle and ductile modes of deformation different constitutive laws, Thanks to Kelly, she unpacked that one earlier, and divide the two deformation styles with a strain rate threshold. And this is not new, by the way. What happens when you apply it to somewhere in the real world? So here's an echogram of Wade's Glacier. There's the top and bottom of it. The uh, hot red over here are basal crevasses. Here's some more detailed geometry of the floating tongue. And calving here at this location is really due to and determined by the spacing of basal crevasses, which are formed at the grounding line. And so, if we can get toward understanding the time-dependent failure of ice at the grounding line at this particular location, we might be well on our way to understanding different fates of plates uh, under different circumstances. So if we use the echogram to create a sort of simplified domain, cut off the tongue, because all we're really interested in is failure at the grounding line, and prescribe some uh, kinematic boundary equations, or boundary conditions, what do we get? So this is all the same model output just different fields of it. This is our strain rate threshold, so anytime it blinks hot red, we're in the brittle regime, cool, we're in the ductile regime, and the resulting failure field from that. And you'll probably notice some funky things going on in the tongue here that I'll be happy to unpack later if you're interested. Um, and we've applied a really simple, uh, extremely simple 10 meters per year basal melting, which I'm learning maybe an order of magnitude off at this point. But uh, just to be sure that our ice is really behaving like ice, we calibrated our myriad parameters to stress strain rate tests for laboratory-derived ice. Um, and so what can we gather from these couple of videos? Um, the model is clearly not perfect. We need to do a better job of remeshing, and we certainly need a better treatment of the melting and accretion algorithms that we have going on. So I'm really excited to hear talks about how we can implement that within the model. Um, but it has potential, so it's already in 3D, and here's a really simple slab of, of, uh, of, of an ice being pulled over a grounding line, and the resulting failure field from this very simple setup. And so just to wrap up, um, the main point is semi-brittle ice might be useful in helping us study and project capping rates at many different locations around the world. But to be sure, this particular implementation of this rheology needs a lot of work. We need to better verify uh, this sort of lightweight, smaller process-based model against the vast array of data that we have um, and really ensure that we are, are, are correctly capturing concrete histories around the world. Um, but best of all, this model is cheap. All of these simulations took less than an hour on four cores and in an environment where the funding pie is the same size and the party of pie eaters may be growing, um, cheap science that's low risk and potentially high reward is always a good thing. And if you feel like Matthew McConaughey watching his whole family history uh, at quantum speed and you're interested, come to me else.